Hello. If you're watching this, you're here at the beginning, uh, the beginning of this project. I've spent the past couple months programming and I've spent the past week trying to make some content that will be worth watching. And I've just got finished reading the script that I've, I've got it straight in front of me, the script of the kind of intro and I hated it. <laughs> I really didn't like it. Um, it felt silly um, in a bad way. Uh, it felt like a, like I was trying to kid someone. Um, so I'm recording this and um, you're probably going to notice that over the course of this video there's going to be a, a bunch of weird edits where um, Probably I'll change my clothes, the lighting will get worse because it's like late on Saturday and I wanted to have something out by the end of the first week of starting to make this stuff and I really do want to do that. Um, yeah, I really do want to do that. So I'm going to just post whatever I come up with and this is the beginning and when I say you're here at the beginning, like I want this to be a big deal. But if you're watching this right now, it's because you're my friend, we know each other, or you're just somebody who's come across me and, you know, I'm grateful for you to watching, but it's not big right now. So, um, yeah, you're here at the beginning. I'm going to talk you through what I was going to say about this project and maybe I'll get it out in kind of the right way. So, all right, I'll start, I'll start. I'm launching a new project and it's called Odes. It's an endless course and with it, I want you to become a great hacker. So the first problem is I don't explain what a hacker is. I'll do that in a moment. I want you to feel confident speaking with the best minds of our field about their work and perhaps even to contribute on that level yourself. I am denied about the word hacker. When I was young, I read an essay by a guy, like all the old people, I mean, like every field, and the computer is not unusual in this, but in every field, you go back like 20, 30, 40 years and you come across like some real dubious characters, but you have to kind of, they, they were the past, you can't get away from that. So anyway, I read this essay called uh, something like How to Be a Hacker by I think uh, uh, Eric, is it Seymour? Eric Seymour Raymond? Raymond something, anyway. Um, and basically it was like, learn to code. Oh yeah, what was it? There was a a, a a line in it which comes up later. The world is full of interesting problems waiting to be solved. Uh, and I thought I was like a teenager at the time. I was like, that's super exciting. Le you know, learn to code, solve all the problems and contribute back what you've uh, made. A hacker is someone who um, delights in solving things using kind of ingenuity and like uh, a, a, a kind of serious playfulness approach to computing in their field. And, you know, you probably hear people walking past because I've not it got too warm in here when I was recording, so I opened the window. Um, but anyway, so... Um, That I found super, super exciting and interesting. And it's what really this project is about. So I'll read on. Um, I've loved computers since I was small, way back then. Um, and over the past 10, 20, probably longer years, a great many people have entered software engineering because they also felt some of the excitement that I felt about this thing. But I think... A lot of them, I think most of them, have not had the chance to really fall in love with it the way that some of us do. And it's really they haven't had the chance rather than they haven't had the ability or, or inclination. They went from a boot camp or from a degree where, side note, I didn't do a computing degree because I thought it would put me off the field. Maybe I was right. 
they went from a boot camp or a degree where they might have only learned a really small slice of this field to a job where they're still only working at the surface of it. And too often, everyone wants to keep them working at that level because that's where the work perhaps needs to be done right now. Um, but I think the result can be boredom and apathy and a sort of feeling of like listlessness and perhaps if this makes any sense to you you've caught yourself wondering wasn't this supposed to be more exciting like the thing i said earlier wasn't wasn't the world supposed to be full of interesting problems waiting to be solved and i'm like doing this every day i mean sure this is economically valuable to me but I swear there was supposed to be something more than this. And the truth is, the thing that I really think is, is, is at the core of this project, the truth is, it is. The world is full of interesting problems waiting to be solved. And this field was exciting in the 50s, and it's only gotten more exciting since then. I wrote down here, we live in an age of wonders, which we do. It's cringe to say, but we do. Um, and then I wrote down, people often say I sound a bit sarcastic, which I do. Uh, so I'm going to signpost this and say, I'm not being sarcastic. If you take off like the armor of cynicism that you use to defend yourself against this field where people kind of compete to be the smartest and, you know, put down each other's work, all that sort of stuff, you put put all that down. And you look at, all right, this is a good bit of the video. Okay, get ready for this. Um, if you look at the thing in front of you, the thing you're watching me on right now, whatever it is, phone, monitor, probably don't look at the monitor, look at the, whatever's powering the monitor, the computer. Or you can look at the monitor if you like. Look at it, really look at it. Don't look at me, look at it. Don't look at me, look at the thing itself. Turn it around if you like, you can still hear me. I'll, I'll tell you when to turn back. The level of intricacy of like detail in this thing should inspire just as much wonder in you as like an ancient tapestry or like a cave painting or, or you know, some sort of ancient wonder of the world. Like these things are in, you know, the ancient wonders and this are just incredible. You, and, and sometimes people get this confused, like, because of course they don't come without, uh, you know, nothing comes out of a vacuum. And some of these things have things about them that make us morally uneasy, like where they came from, the mining, all that sort of stuff. But if you look at all the stuff from the ancient world we admire and think is incredible, that stuff came out of deeply morally dubious situations, to say the least, right? So apply the same approach to these current things and hopefully you'll see these are incredible things and they're everywhere like they're all over the place the you know the microphone this fan probably maybe has a computer in it i guess my headphone like these have you seen these like really are you serious I mean, it's incredible. And you, as a software engineer, as someone who knows some coding of some kind, you've learned enough of the basic tools and language of this field to understand a bit about how these objects work. And you can learn even more, like you can really dig into this stuff and you can understand how these things work. Or, or whatever it is. And that's just incredible. Like you're in an incredible position where just a, f a bit of learning away is some of the most incredible artifacts ever been created by any civilization we know of. And it's that, I'm re just reading the script now, it's that energy, it's that sort of fascination that I want odes to be about um, and more practically it's a course 
really. Um, I, I'm an educator. I make courses, so it's it's that. But it's a different kind of course. It's it's a course in becoming a great hacker. It's a course um, to become someone who can genuinely feel a, a true appreciation, a well observed appreciation. Um, uh, who can work with and appreciate computers on every level, who can talk confidently with anyone else in their field, the, the greatest minds, um, whoever it is you happen to meet, and to contribute as well on that level, whatever it is that you want to contribute. You know, you, you not all hackers are the same back then and now, and I think um, uh, taking what it is you want to um, do with this knowledge is really important as well. It's not just becoming the same sort of person in the way a course, uh, you know, a bootcamp might create essentially the same sort of person. It's about kind of forming your own version of this image as well. And on a more practical basis, it's a course you don't finish. So a set of videos, exercises, written resources, all that sort of stuff, um, where you can spend time on a regular basis to build the skills, knowledge, kind of appreciation for all of this stuff. Um, and with your energy invested regularly over time, and I'm going to do my best. This is an important point to diverge on from the script, actually. I think motivation to do this stuff is the big blocker. So um, motivation is, is possibly the most important part. So making this stuff fun, enjoyable, uh, low effort to start off with and then getting you into the high effort stuff. I want it to be motivating. So I'm going to do my best to be, make it motivating as well. I want to help you become that, you know, the hacker version of you, um, uh, whatever that is. And um, that's that's the mission, really. With your energy reg invested regularly, um, if you come to this on a regular basis and engage with what we're talking about, become part of the the group that forms around it, I want you to become that person and I want you to do what it is you want to do with those skills. Maybe it's, you know, web dev every day for the rest of your life. Maybe it's, you know, embedded software engineering. Maybe it's, uh, you know, light modeling. Maybe it's anything. Um, it could be whatever you want it to be. But there's a common set of language, tools, ideas at the core of this that I think, uh, and approaches also that will become useful for you. Um, the first project that I'm going to work on as part of ODES is going to be about programming. Um, it sounds kind of obvious, but I guess I need to justify it. Uh, programming, I think, is um, it's like the, the maths of software engineering. Um, it's the basic language we use to interpret and to build with. So the stronger you are and the, the kind of broader and deeper your skills are as a programmer, as a coder, like the greater your capacity is going to be to learn everything else, to do whatever it is you want to do. It's going to be titled a reintroduction to programming. You know, I actually already wrote an introduction to programming and now I'm going to write a reintroduction to programming for people who know how to code to some degree, maybe, maybe quite well, maybe not that well yet, but enough to solve some problems already. Um, and are ready to take it to a deeper level uh, to really understand more about what not only what programming is, you know, boils down to what what happens on a lower level, but also just to experience the full breadth of it, um, the different paradigms, the different objects involved, how you know lists work, uh, how people solve problems with programming, the whole spectrum really. Uh, and it's going to focus on six core ideas. I think these are reasonably stable now, but they might change. Uh, first idea, memory, instructions, system calls, functions, structure, and cognition. So it's quite broad. Um, and at this point, I'm going to switch over to another view, and I'm going to talk you through uh, those six ideas through one program. We'll see how that works. All right. This is the program. It's written in a language called C, which you might not know, but it's not super complicated. So I'm going to talk you through it. Uh, the first line, more or less, that executes is line eight. We set a variable called name to zero. Uh, and then we have an infinite loop here. 
every time we go around the loop, we call a function called make it higher, which jumps up to here. It takes a parameter, it adds 100, then 20, then 7, so 127 to that number, and then it returns the result, assigns that back to the name variable, and then it prints out according to this sort of funny format that basically means print out this number, but don't print it out in base 10 decimal, print it out in base 16 hexadecimal. So um, I'm going to compile it. I've actually already compiled it, but I'm going to show you what the compilation uh, command looks like because I thought that might be fun. So it's compiled and I'm going to run it. It just does that. Now you know what it does. I'm going to talk to you about memory. And for that, I'm going to open up this program in a kind of debugger. It's a reverse engineer's debugger, so it works at quite a low level. So useful for us when it comes to looking at how programs really work, or at least work at a lower level. So if I, I'm not going to try and type this command because it's quite detailed. It's called uh, Radar 2 or something like that. It opens up here. It has, um, in a slightly funny way, it has uh, quotes when you start it up. Hopefully that doesn't get too annoying. And I'm going to run this V and we're going to see the program as it is running it in memory. It's not started yet, but this is the kind of initial state that it will start running from. I'm going to skip forward to the main function and show you just this little bit here. So what you're looking at here is the memory of a program. Here's my definition for memory. Memory is a big list of cells. Each cell has an address and a value that we can change. So let me illustrate this for you on this screen. Here we've got, let's say, the address 58171D32305C. Because computers are pretty big these days, the memory addresses are very large. So that's a very large number of some kind. And each, each row, because of the way it's organized, it's like... Um, 16 cells per line, which means that this one, this first one is the one ending with 5C and it's the number 1F in hexadecimal. That's uh, uh, that would be 16 plus 15, so 31, I believe. Don't quote me on that. And then we've got 44, 00, 00, 00 F3, OF, etc. Um, here is one of the most profound ideas in computing. I'm going to make eye contact with you to show you this. Everything in a computer exists on some level in this structure. This big list of numbers. Everything on a computer exists at some level in that structure. Text music, images, video, you know, whether it's on a network or on in a hard drive storage or in memory, everything comes down to this structure. Um, if you can take this idea in your head and truly believe it and really follow through on what that means, all of computing opens up to you. Doing that is quite challenging, but that's really a critical one to keep in mind, especially as we talk through the rest of these ideas. So in O's, we're going to spend quite a lot of time talking about memory. We'll be digging into how memory works at lower levels, building up to ideas like data structures and encoding and compression. For example, at some point, I'm pretty sure we're going to write a program that can, that can compress and uncompress text data, which would be pretty cool. This memory here is the memory that is this compiled code. Um, so this brings us to our next idea, which is the idea of instructions. Now we're going to talk about instructions. Uh, I've turned the light on because uh, it's getting dark. Uh, video makers thing. Um, an instruction is a symbol representing an operation. I worked on that one. Instructions both are memory 
and operate on memory. Instructions are what make programming programming and not electrical engineering. The idea that we can express sequences of operations as data in memory. So what we're looking at here is the same uh, numbers as before. In fact, you can see in the central column these numbers, but interpreted as instructions using a, a lower level language called assembler. Now it's been annotated by the disassembler with these little functions. These functions don't really exist in the instruction, um, you know, in the, in the program as it's compiled, um, but they're put there so we can see them as long, along with them, um, the copyright notice for the uh, GNU C library for some reason. Um, I don't know why, but it's there as well. Just ignore it. Now I'm going to locate a particular instruction, which is the one that corresponds to line eight over here. And it is right here on the offset ending with 168. It says MOV D word square bracket RBP minus four close bracket zero. The zero is what we're putting in there. RBP minus four is, is going to resolve to an address, um, which is, I believe, the base pointer minus four. So um, what that means is we'll go into way more detail about this in future episodes, but um, what it means is each variable in a particular function's environment, so you might call a function three different times and it might have different environments for it called frames, it has a particular location and that location is relative to the frames location. So that's what we're looking at there. So that's that's an instruction there. Of course, there are many, many different instructions here, right? And they've all got different purposes and they're all sort of interesting and exciting in their own way. These numbers are more or less probably perhaps what's going to really run on the computer processor which will run this program. So um, that's kind of exciting. Now the high level equivalent of the instruction is the statement. And we've got a few here. So kind of arguable what counts as a statement and what doesn't. But we definitely got one on line eight. It sets a variable to zero. We've got one on line 11, which it calls, calls this function and then sets the result into this name variable. We've got this statement here, which prints something out. This probably is a statement, um, maybe. Uh, uh, in any case, what I think of as a statement is it's it's a high level instruction which changes the state of the program. Remember when I said when I said instructions both are and operate on memory? Well, statements also they both exist in memory and they operate on memory. That's what for me makes it a statement and not an expression or something else, it changes something about the running state of the program of the computer. It's a slight rule of thumb, but hopefully useful. Um, just like memory in O's, we're going to talk a lot about instructions, both lower and higher levels. Basically, every project, of course, will involve writing instructions because it's programming. Um, but I'm particularly interested in getting you writing some assembler or modifying like the instructions in compiled code. I think through understanding what programs really come down into, what really ends up running on the processor uh, is really enlightening. I can help you make sense of a lot of the rest of the way things work, particularly when it comes to bugs and more subtle issues like memory issues, stuff like that. So that's instructions. Next, we're gonna talk about syscalls or system calls. Syscalls are instructions a program gives to systems outside itself, typically the operating system running it. In this program, the most important syscall is the one that prints text to the terminal, which we can see all the way, um, well, we can see it here on line 12, but if we wanna go into the program, well, I'm gonna to have to show you a few other things, so. Here we go into the, some sort of evaluation route, evaluation um, environment. And then I'm gonna put a breakpoint on a particular part of the program here. Now, when I start this program, you can see that this 
you know, this program is now running. We can see the memory has changed a little bit. And now I want to step through it. Now, this is going to take some time, so I'll speed it up for you. We're looking for the word syscall. Okay, third science the charm. Uh, this time I learned how to use my debugger a little better and I found the real syscall we were looking for. So um, now if I put a breakpoint on here and then keep running, yeah, okay. So now you're going to be able to see all of that work, more or less, was necessary purely to set up um, the memory of the program, the state of the CPU, in order to pass control back to the operating system and then indicate uh, to the operating system that it should print something out to the terminal and what that should be. So all that was necessary to set that up and now we're going to execute it. Okay, here we go. You should see it come out of the terminal now. Yeah, there it is. So syscalls are where programming gets really exciting. Um, uh, you may not get that from all of the amount of work I had to do, but programming gets really exciting when we use it to interact with other things, terminals, hardware, displays, networks, and stuff like that. Syscalls are how a program achieves affecting things outside of itself as well as being essential to building at a lower level, understanding how syscalls work also helps you understand the boundaries of your programs, which will help you become a much more confident debugger. We're going to spend some time in nodes digging into system calls at a lower level, but probably most of the time we'll sprinkle them into other projects as an idea, which will help you make sense of them. So for example, when it comes to displaying images, it'll be fun to see what system calls are involved in that, but this will be most useful when it comes to figuring out what our program is responsible for versus the operating system. The fourth idea in our reintroduction to programming is functions. Um, I'm going to put in here a clip which I think says maybe everything there is to say about functions. Also, headphone warning. I thought about taking the volume down on this, but it honestly would ruin the whole point. So just enjoy it. Turn it up, if anything. <laughs> Most of us learned um, at the feet of our parents the following truth. Functions describe the world. Everything is described by functions. The sound of my voice on your eardrum, function. The light that's kind of hitting your eyeballs right now, function. The entries you put in your random matrices, function. It's all function. Different classes in mathematics, different areas in mathematics study different kinds of function. High school math studies second degree one variable polynomials. Calculus studies smooth one variable functions. And it goes on and on. Functions describe the world. I love that clip so much. Um, functions for us are a callable unit of code, typically taking some input in the form of arguments or parameters and returning some output as a return value and sometimes having some side effects on other parts of a program or a system. Now, functions are an exceptionally powerful idea taken from mathematics and placed on top of software engineering. As we get closer to the idealized world of functions, we trade a sort of like casualness of programming for a kind of disciplined power. And I hope to show you some of the potential of this, some of the brilliance of this in Odes. And I expect that some of that will rub off and make its way into your daily work. One of the curious things about functions is, unlike many other ideas in higher level programming, they they both don't exist on the level of instructions, but they're so important, so useful, 
that they do sort of exist. So I'll show you what I mean uh, by going back round to our breakpoint. And let's break instead on, yeah, make it higher. Yeah, so now we're gonna step into it. And now we're in the make it higher function. So you will have noticed that there is a call instruction in assembler. It, however, is not the same thing exactly as calling a function. It has a little bit of plumbing in it uh, because it's such a common operation to uh, make calling functions in assembler or the equivalent of that easier. But this will illustrate my point. So if you look at the address ending in 157 here, there's one add operation here, and that is this function's core operation. It adds uh, this number in hexadecimal, 7f, which is equivalent to 127, to a particular bit of memory inside the processor. The rest before this, you see we've actually landed on this 149 instruction, is just the, the prelude to doing that, setting everything up, so that the function can start its work. Then after that, we um, have a, 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 I don't know what the opposite of prelude is, a postlude, um, where we get ready to return. And then there's a return function, which will take us back to the original point. So let's step through it. Seven, there we go. And then we step back to the place that we were straight after the function. So now these comments here that say make it higher and main, these are not real functions. We've still, all we've got is, an, is a list of instructions presented to us, which is eff effectively a list of numbers. There are no, there's no such structure in um, this kind of program, but the instructions make it a little bit easier because functions are so powerful, subroutines are so powerful, that we kind of wanted them in, built into computers in some way, but um, just sort of interesting to note. And actually leads us into the next uh, core idea, which is structure. It comes from an idea called structured programming, uh, contributed to the field by a computer scientist called uh, Edsger Dijkstra. I think that's probably mostly right. Um, and Dijkstra felt, it used to be people would write programs much like this, um, a list of instructions, and sometimes they have jumps. So let me show you um, one of those jumps. Let's go down here and up a little bit. Yeah, okay, great. I'm gonna step down. And then we're gonna end up on this jump instruction here on uh, address 196. What this does, because it's an infinite loop and the compiler knows that, it's just going to jump up uh, to another address. So the instruction, the next instruction to execute is going to be set to the address ending with 16F, which of course is this one right here. So when we run this, we end up back here and we'll that'll keep happening for as long as the program runs. So this is how programs used to be written with something called Go To. It's a famous essay called Go To Considered Harmful, which introduce all of these ideas. And programmers would just write this big list of instructions and have a relatively light compiler that would just take each instruction and convert it into um, its equivalent assembly language instruction or its equivalent numbers, really. So Dijkstra felt that this was causing a lot of problems, that humans were really not that good at writing programs in this mode. Um, so he proposed that we write programs in a structure reflecting how we think of them not as how the instructions really come out. So instead of having jump instructions, having programmers write those, we would have programmers write loops instead. That's the idea of structured programming, that you have programs exist as a structure, people write them as a structure. And it's then the compiler's job to translate the structured program that we see on the left here into a list of instructions we see on the right. And I'm broadening this idea of structure out to include some other structural ideas in programming, including expressions. 
So you see on line four here, we have this expression n plus 100 plus 20 plus seven. And that's an expression and it follows, it's a set of operations and values uh, which follow certain rules when it's uh, evaluated. So it's a little bit like a function, but not quite. Um, now, if we were gonna do this in assembler, like hand write it, we would end up writing a series of add instructions uh, but actually, in this program, I believe, the compiler decided 100 plus 20 plus 7. Well, that's always going to be 127, so I'm just going to have one add instruction to add them all at once. So somebody at some point, I don't know who, but I should probably find out, decided that this idea of expressions, like the way that we write things in mathematics, will be pretty handy to have in programming. And basically, every programming language has had them ever since. Um, and we can see this kind of coming out with this compiler here. There are a great many structures in modern programming. Of course, we've got conditions and loops and expressions, but there's also things like async await in JavaScript and other languages to handle asynchronous behavior and many others as well. And we'll look at a whole suite of these in ODES and see how the ideas behind them can help us be stronger and more versatile programmers. For example, we'll spend some time with lazy evaluation, which is a different way of evaluating expressions um, which is, I think, pretty cool, and uh, you might get some interesting ideas from it. I've actually got a little bit of a theory that JSX is kind of related to this idea as well. Now, the final idea is cognition, and here, like I said, I'm talking about human intelligence, not artificial intelligence, um, and cognition, for our purposes, is the mental processes we use to solve these programming problems. I'm not going to say too much about this now, because... You already know how your mind works, but suffice to say, we're going to spend time looking at good, strong, and even expert programmers to analyze how they solve problems and see what ideas that we can sort of appropriate for ourselves. Ultimately, code is kind of one thing, but it's uh, the human mind, you know, AI notwithstanding, that's got to translate the kind of fuzzy world into these precise instructions, and that can be quite hard. So if you can get better at, I think somebody said once, noticing the solutions start to peek out of the problems, then that's going to be uh, really worthwhile for you as an engineer and help you solve many, many more problems than if you just purely focus on straightforward learning the syntax, stuff like that. And those are the big ideas I'm going to be focusing on. It's not all going to be low level, but I do think the low level is a pretty interesting place to start. Also, it's tomorrow, hence the alpha change. Um, over the next few months, I'm going to be uploading videos around these themes roughly once every week. And each one, this one included, is going to come with its own page on the ODES website. You can find this one linked in the description. And it's going to have exercises that you can do to get to grips with this stuff yourself. I'm hoping the videos are going to act as a kind of easy to get into introduction to the particular topic that will get you excited to really dig into the depths and get hands on with some of the stuff yourself. Start building those skills and you know become the great hacker that you can be. Uh, I've got a little starter um, which goes with this video, just a small exercise which if you go down in the description you can go and see and you know try out yourself. This is the start of a really long journey for me. Um, Odes has almost nothing right now so it's really not worth kind of you know paying any money for however if you really do want to support the project uh, I do have a paid membership which is my long-term plan on how to make this project sustainable for me to spend my time on it's ten dollars pounds or euros a month depending on where you are and for that you'll get additional members only content every week um, like I said there's almost nothing there right now so don't do it just for that um, but if you do want to sign up and be one of the first members um, I'd be super grateful. Apart from anything else, I've been working on this solo for the past few months, past six months really, and I'm really looking forward to having somebody else who I'm getting up and uh, doing all this stuff for. So um, if that does uh, take your fancy, then be glad to have you part of the club. Otherwise, uh, follow along and see whether you like the content and uh, think about it later. That's all for today. Check out the link to the site in the description if you're so interested, and I hope you have a great week.